Pierre. Yes. Can you perform at my wedding? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I would have done it. Seriously, I could have. It's right up the street, but I'm, I'm on tour, I think, because it's in August, right? Or yeah. Should we move the date? Should we move the tour? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'll, I'll just call the offspring in some 41 and say, I got to go play Joe's wedding. Yeah. Ticket refunds <laughs> would be easy. Oh, yeah. Lead singer of the band Simple Plan, selling over 10 million albums, releasing six studio albums, performing at the Winter Olympics, and a former marine biologist, <laughs> Pierre <laughs> Bouvier. <laughs> Bouvier. Bouvier. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever, do, you, um, sh- do you watch The Simpsons? Yeah, of course. Do you know that uh, Marge's maiden name, what's her maiden name? Bouvier? Yeah. You come from a line of celebrity. <laughs> exactly. And then there's uh, a couple of different ones. Um, John F. Kennedy's wife was Jackie Onassis, which was Jackie Bouvier, was her maiden name. You're not related to these people at all, right? I hope so. <laughs> I'm waiting to find out. But nah, so far, I haven't really checked. I haven't really dove that deep. But maybe there's not a lot of Bouviers in North America. So Your hair's a little blue. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, I was like, what is, it? is it the light? Huh? <laughs> is it the light? <laughs> you had a, a recent TikTok push with your song, I'm Just a Kid. Yes, huge. Massive trend on TikTok. Yeah. What kind of TikTok, what kind of kickback do you see from that 10 to 15 years later after the song's released? Um. Well, what's interesting is that uh, I could tell you that on Spotify, uh, I'm Just a Kid, you know, it was always a big song for the band, but it wasn't our biggest by far. And it was like, I would say probably... I would say back up like two, three years ago, I'm Just a Kid was probably sitting at like 75 million spins or something like that. And then we had a few that were in the 100 millions, 150 and 200 million, or maybe not close to that anyways. And now since then, in the last two years, I'm Just a Kid has become our biggest streamer. So, and that's all due to TikTok. That's crazy. Yep. So it's become our biggest streaming song of all of our catalog. Does that, that obviously blows up the other songs and did it? It helps everything. And the I mean, I, I think a lot of people have discovered who Simple Plan is through this through this TikTok phenomenon, you know, through the I'm Just a Kid Challenge, through celebrities like Will Smith, Ed Sheeran, and the cast of Friends, and countless others that have done the I'm Just a Kid Challenge. We are, I actually, I could tell you, even like for live shows, the reaction to the song I'm Just a Kid is bigger. Like it's changed so much. Have you had to put it toward the end of the set list now? We always used to anyways. We always used to put it either before the encore or during the encore. Um, which the encore is so funny, you know, you have to pretend you're going to leave for a minute. Let's talk about it. Uh, yeah, What's yeah, the yeah. point? I, there is no point. But if you don't do it, it you, you seem like a like a dick because people are going to go like simple plan. And then you don't come back out. So you have to plan for it. You know what I mean? Do you know who started that trend? No idea. <sighs> no idea. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty genius. But people that do like two encores, three on then now you're starting to get a little crazy. You should do like five. Well, I, technically, I think if you do a second encore, it probably feels more like you did a, an actual encore because everyone knows you're going to do one. Right. right. So let's just count that one. It doesn't even count. Maybe I'll start doing two or three. That'd be sick. And then there's a band. I forget who it was. Probably some funny band. Um, but they would like come out and after two songs, they'd leave. <laughs> and then like, the encore. <laughs> Let's what, get it out of the way, you know? <laughs> what do you think the longevity is for you guys, especially in a world that's turning people over so fast every single day? How are you able to maintain the relevancy? Hmm. Well, for us, I think that, you know, we've been very lucky to have sold a lot of records. And I think that the reason why we are still here is because there are some songs that we've written and that we've done that have connected with people in a very, very deep way. Songs like Welcome to My Life, Perfect, Untitled. Uh, those kind of deep songs where I think that there's a lot of people that were maybe at an age where they were going through a lot, you know, call it from 10 to 18 years old. You're becoming an adult. You're learning about yourself. You're, you know, learning about who you want to be. And then this band comes in and like, you feel like this is who I am. And when you create that sort of bond, especially with more than one song, uh, I think it's one of those things where we have fans that are just never going to not be simple plan fans you know what i mean like it could be like bands for me where when i was growing up whether it's you know uh who i think of uh maybe like there's a band called Lagwagon. it's a really really awesome punk band from southern california and for me i'll always be a Lagwagon fan or if it's blink 182 or green day i'm always going to be a green day fan like no matter you know no matter what happens no matter if they if they stop playing or if they or if they make a record that i'm not into i'm always going to be a fan and I think we've hit that with our career. And now the cool thing is with the I'm Just a Kid uh, phenomenon and the fact of where we are in our age, we're like a legacy act now. Like we come out and play and it's like sometimes there's fans that are 35 years old or somewhere around there, 30 or 30 or between 30 to 40, and they're there with their kids. And, the, you know, then the kids will be like, oh, yeah, you're my mom's favorite band and I love you too. And I'm like, oh, my God, how did this – like we've been in a band – we've been in this band for over 20 – almost 25 years now, so – it's pretty crazy. What's that like for you to write a song that has a moment 
what is it 21 years later yeah yeah 21 years later um it's it's awesome you know i feel like it's uh it's it's a blessing it's like it's really it's what allows us to to have had this career this long so many bands you know have started years and years ago and then later on while well, they're becoming you know real estate agents or something or they're like you know we're not doing this anymore i don't want to tour in a van no more we've never had that problem like we've always been able to have good ticket sales and and record sales and it pays the bills and i get to do this for hopefully the rest of my life you know what i mean so that's that's pretty incredible how old were you when your first album came out i was 2002 23 Nobody likes you when you're 23. It's funny because it seems a little old in in hindsight or in retrospect, but uh, my drummer and I started our first band when we were 13, so that was 31 years ago. And we had like a couple of different incarnations before it became Simple Plan, so we had a, a band called Reset that sold maybe, I don't know, 15,000, 20,000 records and toured across Canada a couple times. When you were 13? No, that's like, so that, that would have been when I was 16, 17. Oh, wow. And then that band existed for about five, six years. So, so when we were 13, we started a first band. It was called Stone Garden, or then it became Roach. So, it, you know, when you start your first band, you kind of have a couple of hiccups. Uh, but technically, so Simple Plan, even though it started in 1999, it was kind of in the works, you know, five, six years before that. Was it those trial and errors with those previous bands that led to the success? 100%. It would have never happened for us the way it did if we didn't go through that before. Because, you know, when I was uh, so when I was 16, we were signed to this little indie label and uh, made a record. Came to California to mix it, uh, and uh, we were pretty big in our in our local area. We played for like a thousand people, sold out the local theaters, did some shows with Pennywise, and even shows with Blink 182 back then. Um, did the Warp tour, but we never made a penny and you know we were working jobs and we were doing this indie band and like it became kind of obvious that we didn't really have we could have kept going but when i actually kicked out chuck of my old band my drummer i kicked him out of the band and then he wanted to start another band and then when we started this one together after making up um we realized like we don't want to go through that again we want to like we want to be signed to america we want to be signed to a major label in the u.s we want people that have money to be able to pay for promotion we want to like we want to be successful you know we we aimed we we wanted to be a big band um so yeah all those things from the previous band you know touring in a van touring across canada and cold weather and crash in the van and doing all these crazy things that was like the yeah the school of like let's do it and let's get signed and let's let's do it big this time how heavily was social media involved in those days because didn't was, exist <laughs> but not even myspace where so, you guys no in 99 in, in 99 myspace didn't exist I forget, maybe it did exist but it definitely wasn't being used um so what we started doing we kind of modeled it off Blink-182. Blink-182 did a lot of video stuff. They had a guy on the road with them called Cheetah. Cheetah. We we basically looked at their model and we said, we'll get a guy with our best friend Patrick came on the road with us and he was our Cheetah. He sold our merchandise when we were in small shows and he did our videos and we did DVDs, all that great stuff. Um, and that's kind of what we based it on. And then we actually had like a website and we, we put our, our emails on there. So we started interacting with fans on email. It was like, Email us at this, so we'd, we'd answer every single email. How stoked were you when you got a new email? Oh, yeah, it's so great. <laughs> so it was Pierre at simpleplan.com, you know, that's what it was, and then like, um, which is no longer my email. But um, but so we did that, and that's how we that's how we started basically the social media because like we we started like communicating with fans that way, and then when MySpace came around, we got hopped on that and sort of did all that stuff. But but yeah, so at the beginning it was really just it was DVDs and. I think YouTube wasn't even that popular yet, and we we basically did that and communicated through email. Did you have a street team? Yes, the SP Invasion crew oh, wow. was big in New York. A lot of people work on that. It was it was really pretty amazing. It was a, a cool time. What was your favorite part of those cheetah style videos with Patrick? Um, the DVD. So we did like a live DVD, uh, not a live DVD, but a, like a lifestyle DVD. It's like three and a half hours long. And like, I could still watch it today. It's a little, it's a little excessive in length, <laughs> but it's hilarious. Like, I mean, and because, you know, now we'll, we'll shoot stuff and we'll put it out the following week on our, on our socials. But back then we shot for, you know, months to maybe a year and a half and then we cut it into one large story so it was really cool to be able to hop on that journey and see the making of the album going on the first tour goofing around just going to 7-eleven like taking slurpees out the machine you know just being you know just being stupid like young kids but 
Um, so that was the most fun part, seeing those DVDs come together and and uh, the the behind the scenes stuff. I can't wait to deep dive into those videos. Oh, you got to watch. It's called uh, a big package for you. Okay, it's on YouTube. <laughs> it probably is. I still watch the Blink ones with the cheetah. When yeah, for sure. Tom would smash his acoustic guitar yeah. in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah. That's so crazy. What was it like being a rock star before social media? Um, it was interesting. There's, I would say there's two major things that are very different than now. First of all, back then, I feel like we didn't really understand or know how popular we were. Whereas now, you have the metrics right in front of you. You can, you can see from one week to the next, oh my God, I just gained 100,000 followers. Oh my God, this video got this. And you see it, you control it, you do it. For us, it was like record sales, which we got reports once in a while, we got plaques once in a while, but we were just a band on tour that was kind of isolated from all that information. So I wish we would have under, we would understood and had the power to control that 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 brand you know that, that we had. Um, and just being also more aware, like I think that kids nowadays, or not kids, but artists or people that are on you know that are trying to promote themselves have a better grasp of what's going on and how they can use it where like back then it was like you're signed to a major label label takes care of that you have a publicist you just do your thing and show up for the interviews and uh so that's one thing and the other thing is that there was a little bit more mystery you know because you didn't have to show everything and i do think that there is you know there's something cool about that. Like if you think about, if you back it up to the '90s, bands like you know, I was into Pearl Jam at some point and Smashing Pumpkins and all those bands. There was a mystery, even Guns N' Roses. There was like you could catch an interview on on a magazine maybe and catch a glimpse of who they were as a person. But now we're out there doing selfies. We're out there doing like confessionals and our you know day to day stuff. It just seems like we're giving so much that there's a lack of mystery. So those are my two kind of points. What kind of change would you see in your own landscape if you got an article in AP Magazine or you got an article in any other type of publication? Would you see it immediately? What do you mean? Would like would more people come out to the shows if you got a bigger mm. if uh, MTV put you into the rotation if you guys got a spot on Z100? I think yeah, because uh, I think one of the major maybe the, a few of the major factors today would be yeah a radio hits a radio hit that's never going to be bad like radio hits are big you know if you if you're on pop radio and you happen to have a song that happens to be playing on all the major stations across America 10 times a day you're going to see the impact of that so that's one playlists on Spotify also a big one um, but i think that a lot of things that mattered like ap you know and like even a rolling stone interview does that really mean much anymore not as much you know like we have you know and we have Pretty big socials. Our our TikTok is up to probably close to two million, if not, I don't know how much it is, but close to there. So we have a lot of outreach on our own, and you know, I think those are just as impactful as like and a lot of times I'm I'm backstage doing interviews for people, and I'm like, this person, like this is going to be seen by no one. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's tough to figure out what matters and what has an actual impact, you know. But I think yeah, Sp Spotify playlists are like the new countdown, you know, the big playlists. And, uh, and a radio hits a radio hit. And then, of course, if you can get a, a TikTok, you know, uh, story like like the Anderson Kid one, then you're then you're golden. Right. Your album. No pads. Yeah, baby, on vinyl. No helmet, just balls. Yeah. It is under Spotify, but it's at the top now as a re-release. Did you yeah. guys get the rights to it? No, no, no. It's 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 interesting. So I find that annoying as well. Um, so uh, was it the 15th anniversary or 20th anniversary? We basically, 15. yeah, yeah, we, we did like, a, I don't know why. It was re-released with, with a couple of songs extra. And that's just how they put it out there. So like the release year is like 2016 or something like that or 17. Yeah. It's silly. No, it's the same album. It was just like we wanted to re-promote it again and it got put that way. I find it annoying. And now that you've mentioned it, I kind of want to go out there and say, this is not a 2017 album. It's a... 2002 you know oh, i built so much stuff up in my head i'm like oh my god they're making more money from it they have rights to it they, there was no, a release a, yeah i know you know you, you look at the taylor swift stuff and it's it seems uh like a cool idea to do that and um but no we i mean we we still have rights to it but we don't own it outright you know it's, we don't own all of it obviously it was signed to uh to lava records that back in the day who they paid for it and they gave us an advance for it so all good what's your ear like do are you hearing things differently than i am are you constantly listening to the next song in your head figuring out how it's going to go hmm what i hear on a daily basis is this 
<laughs> Tinnitus. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But I, I'm very uh, – my wife laughs at me because when we're in the car, you know, I'll, I'll turn the radio off because I like silence, you know. Because if I listen to something, I am unable to listen to something without analyzing it as a songwriter, as a producer. Like, oh, that sounds cool. That snare is really fat. Like, how did they do that, you know? So, yeah, I'm constantly looking at stuff. I'm producing for other people. I'm writing for other people, which is kind of like the next phase of my career that I want to focus on a little bit. Not focus on, but that I want to spend some time in. Um, so yeah, so I'm always analyzing. I'm always like thinking of, I'm, I'm, I'm really a big song guy. I love songs. I like, I love hearing what's new, hearing what people like stuff that excites me. You know, there's so many new songs and I feel like there's, I would say probably 95% of new songs. I just go like, Oh, that was pretty cool. And then once in a while I'll be like, damn, this is good. And I want to figure out why, why, why is it good? You know, who are your favorite songwriters today? Hmm. Favorite songwriters today? Good question. Um, hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I don't really. I'm not really super familiar with who's like writing the big records right now. I know that one of my buddies, Andrew Goldstein, is doing amazing, and I love him. He's written many songs with us. He's written a couple songs, two I think, on the last record, uh, and some on the previous record. He lives in my friend's neighborhood. Oh, nice. I, I love was, Andrew. He's such a nice guy. I went up because I like saying something to somebody that'll kind of shock them, so yeah. that. I'm in their brain and they remember me and then yeah. they'll come on the podcast one day. So when I saw him, I was like, hey, man, love the Friday Night Boys. Yeah, of course. His old yeah, band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, my God, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah he's crushing it right now. Um, who else writes cool stuff? Um, we did a lot. Of, I, I can only speak to the people that I've, I've written with, but we, we wrote a couple of songs with Justin Tranter a little while ago. Huge writer now, like writing amazing stuff. I think he, he, wrote, he wrote a bunch of Bieber massive hits like – is it too late now to say sorry? Oh, he did that? I think so. Great song. Yeah. And I could be wrong, but I think I think Justin did that. But anyways, he's done a bunch of songs. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like, who are my favorite songwriters? I get I don't I can't. That's that's all I got. You were thrown out into this massive success at age twenty three. Mm-hmm. What changed in your day to day life from before that first album to after? Hmm. Interesting. Um not a whole lot, which is weird, you know, because I always feel like I'm, I'm the same guy. Like I used to work at a chicken rotisserie restaurant when I was like 17 for three years. And that was my job while I was in bands. And I still feel like that same guy. You know what I mean? I still feel like I'm that, that, that same happy go lucky guy. I guess the difference is that have obviously my, my, you know, my finances have been a little different. I've been able to do well. I'm a homeowner. I drive a nice car. I mean, pretty regular car, but that's my choice. But like, you know, even like when, when we got signed, we got a few hundred thousand dollars each in a, on a, in a signing bonus. And uh, I went and bought a laptop. You know, and that was like my big thing. I was like, I'm going to buy myself a nice laptop. Is that so you could produce? No, it's because I wanted a laptop and I couldn't afford one before, you know, so Minesweeper. <laughs> so I've never been like really, you know, I like, I like homes. I like uh, stuff like that. But as far as like who I am, and my day to day, it's not that much. Like I, I keep making music. I'm feel like I'm still in this band where we rehearse, we go on tour. I was just came back from a tour on Sunday. I'm leaving back on Friday again. So it's uh, strangely still the same. Thanks for squeezing me in. Of course, yeah. No. Well, I know I, I, we've been kind of like you know talking about it for a while, and I felt bad because. I'm busy, but I'm not that busy. But just like, you know, making the trek down sometimes because I live about an hour and a half away, it makes it a whole day. But then I was like, and I had to go down for this promo stuff with the offspring. And I'm like, hey, I've been, you know, telling Joe I'm going to do this. And I'm like, let's see if he's available. So yeah, last night I'm like, you available tomorrow at 3 o'clock? You're like, yeah. I know. I woke up at 6 a.m. to your DM. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Awesome. Uh, at what point did you realize Simple Plan would be more than just a one-hit wonder? By the second album. Oh. Uh, you know, I mean, here's the thing. Our first album, I, this is a funny thing. It's going to be a, a deeper answer. Um, I feel like we've never had a massive, massive song. Because we've had, obviously, very, very big songs. But where you know, the, there are a lot of bands that have just had, like, bigger songs that, like, everyone knows. And it's just like, you know, whatever that may be. So I always felt like we were a band that, that kind of had a chip on their shoulder that we always wanted to, like, we didn't quite achieve the success that we wanted to. Um, that being said, on our first album, we had multiple songs. We had like, you know, the first song that came out was I Do Anything. It ended up being pretty big, but not too huge. I'm Just a Kid did pretty good. And then Addicted blew up on TRL. It was like 
retired from TRL, which to us was a huge deal. It means it's, it's on there for so long that they have to take it off. Um, and then Perfect was, I think, top three on on the you know uh, top forty, whatever the whatever the biggest chart is. I think it's the top forty charts. Yeah, the top forty songs. It was an, it was a number three on Billboard. So that was massive. And then we followed it up with another record. And we came out with Welcome to My Life, which was another hit. And then Untitled and Shut Up. So so immediately out the gate, you know, by uh, three years into our career, we'd already had multiple hits. So at that point, I was already like, we're already like a, a big name. You know what I mean? But we always felt like, which I'm kind of happy, we always felt like we could have, you could have had a bigger song. You know, it could have been like that one song that just like everyone knows, you know. Yeah. But we've had them. It's been pretty good. Do you think performing Warp Tour 10 times helped or stunted your growth? No, I think it actually, it for sure helped. I think that we always, we wanted to um, always have a foot, because we had a foot in the pop radio world. We had a bunch of pop songs that were big on pop radio. But we wanted the world to know that we're more than just a pop band. We're like, you know, we do Warp Tour. We have energetic live shows. We have songs that are heavy. We, we come from the pop punk world. We come from, you know, Growing up on growing up on Offspring, Green Day, Blink One Eighty Two, you know we're we're alongside bands like Good Charlotte, Sum Forty One, New Found Glory, and we wanted to make sure that the public knew that we weren't like, we weren't. And not, there's nothing wrong with Avril Lavigne, but we weren't like that pop. You know what I mean? We were like still in that pop punk world. Um. So and we did uh, we did uh the Warp Tour, we didn't do it the entire thing every year, but for we we showed up seventeen years on the Warp Tour. 17 of the 24 years that it operated we were on a warp tour for at least a few shows oh wow we actually hold the record right under less than jake really yep that's cool yep you obviously sold so many albums of your debut and your follow-up i feel like you're so grounded you're married you have kids how did you avoid falling into that hole of just like rock star stereotypes just being so grounded yeah i think it's part of like my dna i think that i never i always feel i think maybe to a fault i i feel like uncomfortable in, with famous people like you know a lot of people that that have the opportunity to go into award shows or after parties want to like rub shoulders with the famous people and i'm just like oh so and so's there okay cool yeah i'm not gonna go over there like i i feel like i don't know why like i'm it's just like May, I'm not intimidated. I'm just like I feel like I don't want to be a burden, and it's weird, you know what I mean. So when I when we became sort of famous, I could have easily moved to the hills of Hollywood and like go to the cool bars. But instead, I like you know I fell in love with my girlfriend, and she lived in San Diego, and I was like, we're going to San Diego, and we're going to live in a small little area that no other celebrities are around. And I kind of never gravitated towards that lifestyle. You know, I like to party, I like to have a good time, but I never was attracted to the the that sort of like superficial you know which I, I doesn't have to be superficial to everybody else but like it's 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 not something that ever was attractive to me in a weird way Interesting. i don't know why though i'm just like that that's great though i like having friends in low places you know yeah <laughs> do you um i just have to reset the cameras but yeah you're good when you you obviously had so much success on that first album second album were you guys partying like rock stars we definitely had some good parties. Um, we a lot of cool award shows. I mean, I remember that, that there was a, a period of time when we were touring a lot in Asia, and the Pussycat Dolls were out there a lot, and um, Lincoln Park was out there a lot, and we crossed paths with them. With them, Pink was out there a lot, and we like kind of like had a few parties where like you know high five and Fergie like what's up Fergie she's like hey, what's up simple plan boys so it was kind of fun um what was the tour bus like we always had the loud rocking tour bus like we'd always we, we'd always be that band like a lot of bands which in hindsight maybe it was the wise thing to do was like you know the bus is off limits nobody going there for us we're like come on in have a beer let's go and like we'd crank the music and like the bus driver would show up for a bus call at like 1 a.m or 2 a.m and the bus is just like dance party in there um so it was always a good time we try to have a good time oh, that's so fun so good questions by the way you're doing great am i yeah oh my god uh your your instrument is your voice how do you compare it from now to when you first started because there's only so much you can do right yeah i would say that i uh, i can uh say with confidence that i'm a way better singer than i was back then like um 
you know, people would argue that maybe my voice sounded cooler back then, but I feel like over the years, if you're a singer, if you're a touring singer, you're going to have to learn how to take care of your voice because you're going to lose it. You're going to injure it. Stuff's going to happen. Unless you're singing like really chill music, like if you're singing pop punk, you're going to be, you're going to get into trouble, you know, and you're going to have to go to a voice doctor and they're going to have to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. So with all that information and all that experience, like now we, we usually play headlining shows. So we're out there for an hour, 30, hour and 40 minutes. I, I did three shows in a row. I did Thursday, Friday, Saturday out in the East Coast of Canada um, this weekend. Back in 2002, I probably would have blown my voice. Like I just didn't know how to how to sing, where to take it from. Even sometimes like, you know, get the band to be like, we're not going to play this song. We're going to play this song because that one's too hard for me or we're going to pull it down or something. So I feel like I'm a better singer, can control my voice better. And um, yeah, that's kind of like, it's kind of cool to be able to, to, to improve, you know, because I'm getting old. I'm not going to, I'm like 21. Yeah, I'm 26 now. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I'm 44 this year. And uh, yeah, I feel like I'm, at the top of my game as far as singing goes. Obviously, there's different pockets, but which audience size compare from the U.S. <laughs> to Canada? We have, like, uh, I would say anywhere between... Across the world, we have anywhere between, you know, like, small shows would be 1,500 to, like... And, and these are just headline club shows to, like, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people, depending on where we're going. And it really depends. Like, some places, like in Montreal, we're really big because we're from there. So we'll play for... Yeah, seven, eight thousand people, depending on if we have a hit on the radio at, the, at that time. Um, Mexico's great. Like America's awesome. Like and it goes in waves. Like we were at a time probably in the early, like in the 2013, 14, 15, not as big in the U.S. And then with our 15th anniversary of our first album, we did a, a, a U.S. tour that celebrated that, and that kind of like reignited our fan base in the U.S. And now we play bigger shows there. So it goes back and forth we, we do a lot of cool bigger festival gigs like we played this weekend for eleven thousand people in, in a small town in quebec and like we're we did some shows for like 80 90 thousand people sometimes like so it's it's interesting that we've been able to sort of reach out to the whole world like australia asia southeast asia uh, we played south africa we play a lot in south america and mexico and we we have like a few thousand people everywhere so it's kind of cool what goes through your head when you're performing to ninety thousand people it's easier no yeah it is no it's not yeah because you kind of like they become more a sea of people the smaller the the crowd the more intimate it feels and the more you feel like you're being looked at in a more uh closer way because they are closer like we played our biggest show there was some numbers that were tossed around. We played in front of 150,000 people in Quebec City. I can throw up. <laughs> yeah, it, it was so big you couldn't see the end of the crowd. And it was it was it, it it was super fun and I would do it every day if I could. But it really was not intimidating because you know if they're there, they're stoked to see you. And when a when a crowd of that size screams for you, it's incredible. You know what I mean? And like just the energy of having all those people there, it's almost like you don't even need to be as engaging. Like if I just say, if I go out and I say, Quebec City, how you doing? And the whole crowd just goes, Whoa! where if you're playing for 50 people, a little more intimidating. You know what I mean? You're like, hey, how's it going? I see you over there, James. You know? <laughs> Is your wife there on the side of the stage? Always. What's she thinking? No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> uh, she used to come on tour with me all the time. Now we have two kids and it's a little more difficult. But she, she, she loves it. It's a good time. I think now what's cool for me is to watch my kids watch me play. Because now my, my daughters are 10 and 11. And my youngest, who's 10, wants to be in a band. She's like, wants to be a rock star. And she just loves watching me play. She's just up there and she's like singing along and jumping up and down. And I walk off stage. She's like, you were so good, Dad. And my other one's like... Are we going home soon? <laughs> so it's cool to see it through their eyes, you know, and be able to. I, I, I'm so grateful that I can still play big shows. We're going on tour with The Offspring. It's going to be sold out almost everywhere in America. And my kids are going to come out to Irvine and San Diego to come see me play. And I think it's so cool that I started a career 20 plus years ago. And now that my kids are this age and I have kids, they can still see me play and be like, whoa, dad's got dad's got it going on you know what i mean i'm not just some guy that you know records other bands at home and like makes your sandwich for you before bed because you want to you know my, my <laughs> oldest daughter always wants a banana sandwich before bed so <laughs> it's funny back in the warped tour days band beef uh yeah we have a uh did you have feuds with anybody <laughs> oh my god you did you I never know if i'm supposed to talk about it because yeah of course you are lightweight loves drama yeah it, it's uh it's it was a it was a small beef 
it was interesting and 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 I apologize if the band doesn't like when I'm talking about this but um we had a little bit of a beef with some 41 in the beginning of our career there was a miscommunication uh Chuck was a writer for a, a newspaper and he and he uh he uh what he gave it gave a review of their first EP and he didn't give it like five stars he gave it like 3.5 he said it was pretty good, blah, 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 whatever. And they don't speak French. This was a French newspaper. And someone at their label told them that Simple Plan reviewed their EP and said it sucked. <laughs> so they were really pissed, <laughs> as they should be. Uh, but that's not what happened, you know what I mean? So yeah. they were, like, they were kind of pissed at us, and, like, we didn't know why. And there was a bunch of, like, kind of, like, mud mudslinging for a little bit. And after, like, maybe eight, nine years of that, we we never really crossed paths and stuff. Uh, but we always knew that they were pissed, and we were like, screw those guys. And then at some award show in Toronto, um, our dressing rooms were next to each other, and I crossed paths in the hallway with the drummer, and he immediately said, like, hey, man, I'm so sorry. This is just stupid, this whole thing, because they talked shit about us, and we talked shit about them. So we buried the hatchet, and it, right then and there, it was all squashed. And, and now we, you're on tour together. And we played some shows together, and like last year, we went, we went on tour through all through Europe and uh, and, and America together. Was it America? It was America. Yes, it I, was. Yeah, and it was awesome. And yeah. it was sold out everywhere, and it was incredible. And now, unfortunately, Sum 41 is, like, I guess, disbanding in a few years. Yeah, he sold the rights, right? I don't know. He he did something about selling his the catalog to his music. Right. Derek, yeah. is that something that you would ever want to do? We did that. We, we sold a part of it early on. Not we, early on. Years ago. What's the benefit of that? Money. Mm. Do you sell the back catalog or things like a part of the whole pie it's well when we did it it was it was uh i love that you didn't laugh on that i was like that was supposed to be funny pie uh, no 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 money like you know what like why would you sell your catalog so basically oh, if, uh. if you have a few <laughs> hits your your hits generate money every right. every quarter you get a little check in the mail and you get you know whatever twenty thousand or fifty thousand or a hundred thousand or two hundred depending how big your songs are what's the biggest check you've ever seen uh it seems like two hundred thousand for oh, a quarter gosh. I mean, compared to YouTube, money's not even that big anymore. Yeah, but still. That's what's crazy. That's your music. That's yeah, sick. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so why you would sell your rights? Basically, a company would be like, we're going to give you 10 years of that worth of that money right now. You can do whatever you want with it. And if, you know, if the catalog increases in value, then they, they get, you know, they win from that deal. And if it decreases in value, then you win from that deal. Who buys that? A record label? It can be uh, venture capitalist groups. It can be people that are investing in that. Uh, for us, we sold it to uh, our publisher because we had a publisher and they we had you know a deal with them and they wanted to buy the publisher side. With your song being part of, it was part of the movie, right? Uh, New guy. Yep. Is that how does that work? What who who approached to? Was that a big opportunity for you at the time? Were you excited about that? Yeah. Yeah, we had we had, in the beginning when we were on Lava Records, we had a, a guy um, that was responsible for placing movies in TV shows and I, I'm sorry, music in TV shows and, and movies. And his name is Kevin Weaver. He still does that today. I think he's like president of Atlantic Records now or something like that or one v VP. He's huge. But his job back then was to place music from Lava Records and Atlantic Records into movies and TV shows. And we had like 150 placements with him. Like we did like so many movies, TV shows, like Big Brother. Uh, we did um, a movie called Cheaper by the Dozen. We had New York Minute. We had You had your own song in Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo, yeah. So um, so it was awesome for us to do that. And, and uh, I think it was hugely helpful for the band to be able to have that visibility. So anytime we had the opportunity to team up with these big movies, we did. And what the cool thing is that stuff like The New Guy – and uh, the, we did a song on the Scooby-Doo movie, what would happen is that we would leverage the song and they would pay for the music video. So like for, for, for I'm just a kid and the new guy, they probably, I don't forget, I forget what it was, but they probably kicked in a hundred grand or 200 grand for the music video. And in partnership, the songs on the soundtrack, and then that way there's celebrities in this in the in the music video. So it's kind of a cool partnership and Tony Hawk was in there. so. Um, it was great. Who pulled Tony Hawk? They did. Tony Hawk was in the movie. Um, and the funny thing is this, is that Tony Hawk is not actually in our music video. They ha they just took a piece that he's in the movie and they spliced it into our video because he wasn't available for the shoot. Oh. <laughs> so people are like, so what, is, what was it like to meet Tony Hawk? I'm like, uh, I don't know. I didn't meet him. Yeah. <laughs> Although I met him years later. I did a, a thing with uh, Matt Cutchell for Emo's Not Dead. Uh, and uh, I did meet him then. So That's so cool. Yeah.
I love that we have like matching outfits type thing. I know you and Matt had a matching outfit. Too. I know. Like, what, I wonder I know. if we're gonna wear the same thing. I thought the same thing when I when I left this morning. I was like, this is kind of what I mer- what I what I wore when I went to Matt's podcast. That's so, funny. so what's your day to day like now? Because you have two kids, you have a wife, you're on tour. Are you constantly doing <clears throat> simple plan stuff? Are you more in dad mode? So yeah, there's two aspects of my life. There's dad on tour which is the same as it was 20 years ago. You know, I just, I leave for like, I'm leaving on Friday for five and a half weeks. So that kind of sucks. It's fun, but it sucks for the family side. And then when I'm at home, because of my job, I get to be, you know, a dad, you know, very, I could be 24 seven dad. I like this morning, I took my kids to camp. I made them breakfast and usually I pick them up in the afternoon and like we do stuff together. I make them dinner. So my wife gets a break as she works as well. Um, so it's really like these two, completely opposite lifestyles where I'm at home and I'm super involved. I'm cleaning, I'm doing laundry, I'm doing the kitchen, I'm, I'm, you know, changing the sheets on the beds and I'm like taking care of the animals. We got, we got, we got chickens, we got dogs, we got a cat. Um, and then I go on tour and I'm just gone for like four or five weeks and then my wife has to pick up all the slack. And then there's the other aspect of when I'm at, when I'm at home, I sometimes get involved in some projects that I'm into. I did some stuff for Chad Tepper. I did some stuff with a new band that's, that's, that's uh, going to be releasing stuff pretty soon. Um, so, yeah, I do a little bit of all that together. What would you say is your biggest dad quality that you've taken on? Hmm. Because I look at you and I just picture rock star. I don't picture yeah, dad. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't picture you changing diapers. I don't picture you. I was a diaper guy. No, I think that um, I think when I'm at home, I just do a lot with my kids, whether it's like I entertain them. Like, if we're like, what are we going to do? What do you guys want to do? You want to go to the beach? I take them to the beach. I take them roller. I I go to the roller skating rink with them. Uh, I actually have my own roller skates now. I like bought the real deal because um, the rentals are crap. Uh, <laughs> I I you know I take my kids golfing with me. I I literally I think the biggest quality is that when when I'm at home, I'm the one that does like the wake up in the morning, take them to school, make them breakfast, feed them dinner, make sure they're in bed plan out play dates with friends stuff like that so i'm like really involved when you go drop off your kids at other people's houses are any of the parents like (laughs) no like i live in a small town and uh and it's like it's more like the opposite i think when people if they see my instagram or if they see like sometimes like the last time we played in la a bunch of you know i live in a small town called ojai and uh and a lot of my friends um came to the show in la and there was like a group of like 12 of them. Like your oh hi dad friends? Yeah. And like my <laughs> wife grew up there. So they're like friends through my wife. Yeah. And they showed up and they were just like, it's so crazy to see you like on a stage. And you're like jumping up and down and the whole crowd just like losing their minds. And we're like, it's just Pierre. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's this weird thing like where they don't, they see me more like a normal guy. Like, you know, I go to the grocery store every day to pick up. Guys, I live close to the grocery I love going to the grocery store. I go all the time. And uh, I'm sure that the people that work there, are, they're, I'm just the guy that shows up at the grocery store. I'm not some rock star, you know. It's pretty weird. <laughs> to wrap it up. Yeah. Over the, the course of your 21-year career, yep. what was the most lucrative financially? Was it making the albums? What yielded you the most revenue? The, the most revenue is, is for me and my and whatever we've gone through has been when we had uh, big songs on the radio, like on Billboard. Why is that? Because you'd have these, uh, well, the publishing money. So when you have those big hits, it just generated a lot of money. And like when record sales actually sold, like our first record, that's that made a lot of money. But I think it really was like those big checks. It was like, yeah, two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars per quarter. So that's like you know a million dollars a year just off the radio spins, you know. Um, and I could be wrong on those numbers, but it was a lot, you know what I mean? And because of that, we were able to get big publishing deals through the big advances, stuff like that. Um, and uh, and yeah, that was, that was pretty nice. Does it blow your mind that people don't buy physical albums anymore? That cars don't have CD players anymore? Yeah, uh, I, I like the convenience of, you know, like everybody else, digital is cool. Did you hate it at first? Well, I don't like, I like it. But I find that there's so much out there. Same thing with podcasts, and I'm sure it's a challenge for you. Like, there's so much out there. There's no more gatekeepers, which is cool for everyone because everyone gets to compete in the game. You just buy a camera, or you buy a laptop. You can. Make, I, I just literally making records in my in a room a little bigger than this in my house. Um, so now it's a it's a it's a it's a competition of drive 
and talent and vision. It's no longer about getting to know the right person and being like, okay, we're going to put you on the stage. You know what I mean? So it's cool. But when you were in that position, like we were, where we were signed to a major and we were one of the lucky few that got picked, it was nice cush. You know, it was nice to be there and be like part of those, those elite few, I guess. So I understand it. I like it. It's cool. But I do think again, um, you know, too much to choose from sometimes is uh, is a bad thing. And one thing that I that I don't particularly like as much is that I find that the world is becoming a little homogenized with everything, whether it's food, like fast food, like Starbucks, like whatever, uh, movies, you know, design taste. Everyone, you go to like Australia, you go to Southeast Asia, you go to Europe, and like everyone is like into the same band, same movie, same star. Like it used to be, I find that there was like Canada, Mexico, other places would have like, yeah, there was the major artists that people were into, but they also had a bit of like local people that they were into. And that's kind of disappearing a little bit. So that's kind of because the platforms are, you know, Instagram, TikTok, all that. And those are worldwide everywhere. So what what video is going to catch your attention is probably going to catch the attention of the person that lives in Cambodia. You know what I mean? So it's it's interesting, you know? Yeah. Cool. So philosophical. I know. I love it. <laughs> That's it. Thanks so awesome, much for man. being here. It's a pleasure, dude. Simple plan. No pads, no helmets, just the bulls. If you haven't listened to Simple Plan yet, you're living under a rock. Yeah. Go check them out. Spotify, Apple, YouTube. Go check out Pierre on Instagram. What's your handle? Pierre Bouvier. Thanks for coming by and thanks Thank for squeezing you. me. And is this coming out? Um, is our uh, the podcast coming out soon? I mean, it went so well. I want to post it now. Okay. Well, if you do, we're on tour all across the U.S. in August. Wow. Yeah, yeah, with the Offspring. So we're going all through the U.S. Push that thing. Cool. Go check them out. Ow. Bye. Cool. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure, man. That was great.